Hello, and welcome to Sobercast. We provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast format. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into the virtual basket. Also, if you're a member of NA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, NAPOD. NAPOD features NA speakers and workshops in the same format as Sobercast. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for NAPOD, N-A-P-O-D, all one word, on any podcast player app, or go to NAPOD.XYZ if you'd like to listen online. Hope you enjoy the podcast and have a great day. Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate all the, the birthday people, the fantastic line of birthdays. Uh, if anybody ever needed evidence that this works. Um, uh, and uh, also, um, they welcome all the newcomers, and I hope you stick around. Everyone in this room was a newcomer at one time, and uh, we're not because we stuck around. We kept coming back often against our own will at first, and, but um, it, it seemed to work that way. Um, and uh, uh, Andrea is a hard act to follow. Uh, what, a, what, a great, what a great and powerful talk um, that was. Um, my s- story uh, starts uh, at the beginning. <laughs> um, uh, as, as many of you could tell, I'm not from around here. Originally, um, I was born in Northern Ireland, which is, uh, it's close to Ireland, geographically. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, my, my family was kind of middle class. My mother was a school teacher. My, uh, she was the principal of the school, and my father was a businessman, and neither of them was alcoholic. They had other problems, but that was, alcohol was not it. And, uh, uh, uh and for some reason uh, that I don't think is even relevant maybe here, um, I wound up just feeling completely alone in a family that, um, you know, was perfectly normal otherwise. And uh, something about me, just uh, as uh, Andrea said, you know, I, I felt alone, I felt separate, I felt I was different, and I felt I had to have all the answers myself. And uh, uh, I did well in school, and uh, I was going to be a, the, the doctor in the family, and uh, uh, I was all bound for uh, uh, Queen's University uh, to go to medical school, and uh, my uncle, who was a doctor, um, talked me out of it. I'd spent the summer with him, And uh, he saw that I was squeamish, and uh, I didn't like being around sick people that much. And uh, uh, he said, you know, I think you maybe ought to think of something else. Uh, And uh, so I did. Uh, I I thought of something else, and um, it was getting close to the time to find something else. And so I applied to a seminary, and they accepted me. A lot of people go through a lot of agonizing before they decide to go to a seminary in order to be a priest. Um, I didn't. I just, uh, you know, the first letter of acceptance I got, I took it. And, uh, and, and, and this is characteristic of my life. I was the kind of person that never had a clue what I wanted to be. I could tell what you wanted. I never knew what I wanted. And mainly, I was codependent as hell because I knew exactly what you wanted from me. Um, And uh, so uh, I, I, for lack of a decision, I went to seminary. And, you know, at 17, you kind of figure seven years, it's an eternity. Who knows what will happen? And what happened was that every year I did my exams and I was invited back. And then one year, I did my exams, and they ordained me. (laughs) And, uh, you know, that's just how it happened. And I I wound up in Sacramento, California. The lucky people got me to preach 
the gospel to them. Uh, I, I wasn't even sure how much I believed in anything. And uh, I, I was there about six months, and, and it dawned on me one day, you know, after the novelty wears off, you know, coming to a strange country, people calling you father, all the dressing up, you know, all, all of that stuff all wears off, you know, then it becomes like, what am I doing here? And I, I remember when I was newly sober, I heard a woman in uh, talking about it, and it was the closest I came to somebody uh, talking about the way I didn't make decisions. She said she woke up one day and she's in the aisle at Kmart and she has got two kids. And the last decision she made was a sophomore at McClatchy High School in Sacramento. You know, and I mean, I totally identified with that. It was like just things happen and you let them happen. And then all of a sudden, you realize this isn't a rehearsal for my life. It's the show is in progress, you know, and, and you come in like halfway through your life and you wonder, how did I get here? And, uh, so, but I never was very good at decisions. And now I want to tell you, I had not started drinking yet. I didn't start drinking for about another year and a half. And then it was only at the invitation of the pastor of the parish, he said, uh, you know, if you ever feel like taking a drink, uh, there's a bottle of old granddad in there, 100 proof, and you, you know, feel free to take a nightcap. And I said, nah, I don't think so. And then I thought about it, and I thought, you know, I've never really done that. And I took about this much old granddad, Hunter proof. And let me tell you, it did more for me than ordination. It did more for me than any sacrament or prayer or anything. I, I felt saved. I mean, <laughs> something that had been missing all my life was suddenly there. And it was like, how stupid can you be? I'm like 26 and I just discovered the one missing ingredient. And, and I, I caught on to it very quickly um, because I wasn't stupid. I recognized a good thing when it happened. And uh, within about a year and a half, I was drinking a fifth to a quart of old granddad every day. And I was working. One thing I did because I didn't know what I was doing being a priest, I just got really busy. I had more converts in Sacramento than any other parish. I had raised more money, and I taught high school full time, um, and and still worked in the parish. And uh, so, but at this time, I'm also running into that problem of getting rid of my empty quart bottles every day, and and the only place that was private in a rectory where it's run by, really, not by the pastor, but by an old Irish housekeeper. And she does everything, your laundry and everything else. And you know, there's nothing sacred except this big steamer trunk I had brought from Ireland that had a lock on it. <laughs> and I was a couple of years sober, and I still had that full of empty bottles <laughs> of old granddad. I mean, it was like a dead body in the closet, you know. It was like, <laughs> just, I mean, how do you get rid of it, you know? And so, uh, and and I had a problem buying this stuff because, you know, I, I would need some early in the day, and I bought all the gift wrap liquor in Sacramento. <laughs> I would go in and have these long conversations with the guy in the liquor department or the liquor store about gifts for imaginary people. <laughs> and I would come out and I would, at the back seat of my car was full of rosettes. You know, those little rosettes on the top of the gift wrap liquor. And I'd go around the corner, rip the rosette off, open the bottle, and, you know, and then, uh, and now I got sent for by the bishop and I thought I was in trouble 
But instead of that, he said, we have been watching you. And I was going, oh, God. And he said, we would like you to go off and get a doctorate in canon law, which is kind of like the fast-track degree in the Catholic Church. To get a doctorate in canon law was a kind of like promotional, you know. And uh, so it was like, yeah, sure. Uh, anything to get out of Sacramento. Uh, five years in Washington, D.C. in 1965. I mean, wow. Um, and uh, a friend of mine told me, he kidded me, he said, canon law, for Christ's sake, O'Connor, what are you thinking of? You know? and, and I said, well, it's, I could get away. And he said, you know, he said, I think I knew if they had offered you ballet, you'd have probably taken it, you know. <laughs> and so when, when I was going away, my gift from him was a leotard and a long playing record of Swan Lake, you know. Um, <laughs> but but uh, so, I, you know, but... Uh, you know, I had a lot of fun with drinking in one way, but in another way, it was gradually getting. And when I was two years in Washington, uh, it was starting to get to be a real problem. Uh, I mean, uh, I would go on the wagon for two weeks before finals, but I was doing stupid stuff. Like, um, I also had a, a habit of looking for things that made you energetic if you know what I mean. <laughs> and there's nothing worse than an energetic alcoholic. <laughs> and, and I, like, I, I got pulled in three times in one day for drunk driving. Um, you know, it, that's what I mean. I, being an energetic alcoholic, you know, you don't pass out, you go for a drive, you know. <laughs> and uh, so the... Uh, but uh, eventually it started getting to where uh, my depression, which I think had probably always been there, started to come to the surface. And when I would get drunk, I would get suicidal. And, uh, and sometimes I would just get terrified. Um, I remember the last uh, uh, time before I decided to do something about it. I remember sitting on the pillow in my bed, afraid to close my eyes in case I would lose my mind. I, I knew that if I let go and went to sleep or closed my eyes, I'd wake up in an insane asylum. I had to try to keep hold of it. Um, I uh, came home from D.C. in uh, summer of 68, uh, and I called on, along the way. Uh, I called the only alcoholic priest I knew in recovery. I knew a lot of alcoholic priests, but the only one in recovery. Uh, and uh, and uh, I called him, and I told him about a friend of mine who had a problem. And so we talked for about 10 minutes. I think I was in Pittsburgh or someplace on the way home. And uh, he said, uh, so how much are you drinking? You know, and, uh, and, and that was a kind of, uh, he eventually became my sponsor and uh, a great guy. And he had like about 15 years sobriety at that time. And uh, to me, that was an eternity. And he said, well, why don't we meet at an, a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous in Sacramento? Don't drink that day. Uh, he said, it's a Tuesday night meeting at Creekside in Sacramento. And he said, he told me where to meet him. And I did, and I hadn't drunk. And I was so leery. I mean, it was like, oh, God, has it come to this? You know, Alcoholics Anonymous, for Christ's sake. And, <laughs> well, I was kind of, I, I was suspected it was kind of Protestant, you know. <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> and and being such a good Catholic, you know, it's like, um, and so I I met him outside this this place, and we came up to the door, and the the meeting was already in progress, and uh, and I caught him by the arm, and I said, Joe, I'm not joining tonight, <laughs> and he looked around at me and. He was very wise. He never argued with an alcoholic. He just looked at me and he said, okay, don't sign anything tonight. <laughs> uh, 
And I said, okay, I'll just listen. You know, so... <laughs> I haven't signed anything yet, you know, which is kind of neat. But uh, so uh, that night, I don't remember much about it, except I remember the, the really positive thing about AA that night for me was this. They were talking about spirituality and God and using four-letter words. Uh, you know, this effing spirituality, you know, and stuff like that. And it's like, Wow. This is cool. <laughs> you know, I had had religion up to here, and anything that sounded different might work, you know. And, and, and that sounded different, you know. Uh, and, uh, but uh, after a couple of, and I was thinking of this when Andrea was talking also, I found out there was a book. And I decided to do a home study course. I mean, if there's a book, I can figure out a book, right? So I uh, called Father Joe up about a week or so later and said, this AA isn't working. Do you have any other suggestions? Because I was drinking again. And he said, actually, I do. He said, some people need something different. I said, great, that's me. And... So he got me in the car the next morning, and he took me to what in those days we called a fidget farm, uh, drying our joint, uh, rehab, you'd call it today. And it was up in Sonoma County in the Valley of the Moon, and it was run by this guy called Truman Harley, who was like a really great character, but I was scared to death of him. Um, he said things behind my back that were insulting, like, I think he's an intellectual. <laughs> and there was something about the tone of it. I knew he didn't mean it the way I hoped it would be. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, for me, an intellectual is somebody educated way beyond their capacity. <laughs> and so, <laughs> you know, and... He had a habit of saying things like this, but eventually I, I, I actually had a really good experience in that, and I'll talk about it a little bit later. But um, I, I wish I had, I stayed sober for quite a long time after that, but then I stopped going to, I went back to school in the fall, stopped going to meetings. I went to a meeting, and they didn't welcome me with open arms. And I thought, well, screw this, you know. And so I didn't go back. And uh, then I got drunk. And uh, um, so I got drunk two or three other times. And I finally got sober. Uh, my last night of celebratory drinking ended with a suicide attempt in my car in the rectory in Sacramento. I had finished my doctorate. I had come back. I was promoted. I was everything was in, going in my favor in the bishop's office. I was like the third in line in the diocese and all of this stuff. And um, you know, I started drinking and I wanted to kill myself. And uh, uh, I uh, I tried to uh, uh, put I put myself to sleep. And I started the car, and uh, I woke up at 4 o'clock in the morning. Um, a word of advice to anybody who's planning anything like that is don't do it with a loner. I had wrecked my car the day before, and I got this old Mercury from Harold Ford in Sacramento as a loner, and it, it stalled, and I woke up at 4 in the morning, hungover, the car mustn't have run more than 10 minutes after I went to sleep. And, and so I, 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 I stagger out of the, the garage, and I wake up, you know, and I'm, it's 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm sitting out with my back to a rail fence uh, in South Sacramento listening to the frogs, uh, February 22, 1971. And... Uh, I called Sacramento Recovery House, and the guy who ran it, Walter, said, come on down. He said, what do you want to do? I said, I will do anything you tell me to do, Walter. And that was the first time I ever got there, where I would always do it, like, just enough to not drink, maybe. 
But the idea of like jumping right into the river was like beyond me. I would never lose control to that extent, you know, and, and have somebody else tell me what to do. And at this point, you know, my ass was on fire. I would jump in the river. It couldn't be any worse. And uh, so um, I, I did that. And, uh, um, you know, my sobriety starts from that time. Um, some of the people who had been in the first place with me uh, were celebrating their third anniversary sobriety. They came up, and I, I thought they were rubbing my nose in it, actually, but they celebrated with me. I was still waiting for my laundry to come back, you know, and I thought I was brighter than they were. Um, um, I, when I when I got sober after a while, um, you know, somebody asked me to speak at a meeting, and I, I asked my sponsor. I said, "What should I talk about?" And he said, "Well, Seamus, you're a real smart ass, you know." And he said, "So why don't you talk about how you messed up your program?" He said, "Maybe somebody might get something out of that." And so that's what I. I, I, I talk about. There are a couple of things that really I had so much trouble getting past my denial. I mean, you talk about many of us tried to hold on to our old ideas. I wouldn't let a new idea into my mind, you know, unless I was dying. And uh, it, it was the, the hardest thing I got to do was get a new idea. And uh, so this guy, Walter, who ran Sacramento Recovery House, he, uh, ha we had a, a commitment to come back to a Monday night meeting in the recovery house after we got out. And I, I, about three months after I'm out, uh, I'm back at one of the Monday night meetings, and uh, we're talking about the insanity of alcoholism. And, you know... And I still hear this at meetings, you know. I, we, we all did the, the thing where, you know, some guy's talking about, man, I know I was insane when I was drinking. I drove over the, the grapevine in the snow, and I woke up in Bakersfield. I don't even remember leaving L.A., you know, and I know I'm insane. And somebody else had another great story, and I, I couldn't wait for mine. You know, I had a big insanity story, how I got my car stuck on the tracks at the Western Pacific Railway tracks at midnight. I decided it was a good place to turn around. <laughs> It's not. And particularly when the zephyr is due, you know, the, it used to be, you know, come steaming through Sacramento like in the morning, you know, and so I had to get towed off, and I, this is my insanity story. And the next thing I hear is this horrendous ruckus, and it's Walter. Now, Walter, who ran Sacramento Recovery House, was a graduate of both San Quentin and Folsom. He was known professionally as Walter from Philadelphia, who solves problems. And for some of those solutions, he did time, long, hard time. So we were all terrified of Walter. And so Walter kicks this heavy kitchen chair back, grabs it, smashes it on the floor, and says, for Christ's sake, will somebody talk? about the insanity of alcoholism and shut up about how goofy you were when you were drunk. And he storms off into his office. It was like, ooh, wow, what was that? And we looked at each other and we didn't know what was, we didn't understand it. And two or three days later, I come by the recovery house for a cup of coffee and I'm going in and I, I says, so, Walter, how are you doing today? I'm kind of patronizing, you know. And he looks up from his chair and he said, You stupid son of a bitch. You still don't know what we're talking about at this program, do you? I says, What do you mean? He said, For three years I've listened to you talk about how insane you are after you start drinking. He said, that's not the insanity of alcoholism, not according to this book. And he sent me out to my car to bring in my big book. 
And he said, I want you to open it at page 35. I opened it at page 35. He says, do you have anything underlined on page? No, I got something underlined on page 34. Uh, he said, page 35, he says, says, so we shall describe some of the mental states that precede a relapse into drinking, for obviously this is the crux of the problem. You didn't think that was important, did you? Uh, I, I don't think I, I must have missed that. <laughs> and then he, he says, okay, open to page 24. And I open to page 24. He says, do you have anything underlined there? Um, no. Is there anything you notice? Well, yeah, there's italics. He says, why do you think it's in italics? It's important? He said, no, because they couldn't afford neon. And, and it says, the fact is that most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice in drinking. Their so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We are unable at certain times to bring into consciousness with sufficient force the memory of the suffering and humiliation of even... We are without defense against the first drink. I thought it was the second drink, you see. I thought it was up to me about the first drink, and then I lost control. I didn't realize that I was powerless. And he took me through this. I mentioned these page numbers, incidentally, uh, for the Protestants. <laughs> you wonder why I'm saying that? Did you ever notice Protestants go to church and they carry the Bible? And when the minister quotes something, they want to know chapter and verse. They also want to know what translation, that he's not using one of these flaky new ones. <laughs> right? We have some Protestants here, right? <laughs> because they want to know that he's saying it right. He's not making it up, you know. <laughs> Catholics, they kind of go, well, it's probably close enough. So, for the Protestants, <laughs> page, page 24 has the italics, and page 35 is the crux of the problem. Uh, and, you know, I, and he told me afterwards, he said, you know, we got through with this, and he did the, you know, page 43, once more, the alcoholic at certain times, there's no effect of mental defense against the first drink, neither he nor any other, you know, that passage. And he got through with it, and he's looking at me, and I'm going, yeah. Do you ever have a sponsee go, yeah? Your point is? You know, you've just told him something that's about his life and death, right? And he goes, yeah. <laughs> he said, all I could think of, he said, was one of those old soda machines you put the money in, and you hear it fall and nothing happens. You know, the, the can doesn't roll down, you know. And he said, I just felt like slamming you up the side of the head or something to get the coins to drop, you know. And, and he, he, he says, I took one last shot at it. And, and his last shot was this. He said, you had not drunk anything or used anything for seven months, right? Right. The last time you were sober. Yeah. You got in your car and you drove up Freeport Boulevard to Hollywood Bottle Shop. Right? Yeah. Was there any alcohol or drugs in you? No. You go in, you pick up a bottle and you bring it up and you pay Willie. While you're paying, is there any alcohol or drugs in you? No. And then you drive back down Freeport Boulevard. And you go in your room, and you pour some in a glass. And he did this with this coffee cup. He says, even when it's up here, is there any alcohol or drugs in you yet? No. And then he did this. He said, for three years, we've heard you say, 
that the insanity was caused by the drug entering your body. If you don't know that you are insane on your way up Freeport Boulevard, in the Hollywood bottle shop, on the way back down again, he said, you don't belong in Alcoholics Anonymous. You better find a chapter of Morons Anonymous. (laughs) And, And I was like, but what about it's the first drink that does it? He said, do you think that was not discovered till 1935? He said, for Christ's sake, Aristotle's own grandmother knew that. Lay's potato chips knows that. Everybody knew that. Bet you can't eat just one. You know, I mean, you know, you start an addictive process and it takes over. That was not discovered in 1935. What AA talks about is the crux of the problem is the mental state that precedes the first strike. I had not got that in three years of sitting at meetings thinking I was listening. But I wasn't letting in the stuff. My denial was not let in the stuff I didn't want to get in. I wanted to believe that I was sane up until I put the drug in my body. And that was like the uh, just, uh, I mean, an incredible. I scared the hell out of me, actually. And I said to Walter, I said, well, you know what that, you know what you're telling me standing here right now, three months sober, that, 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 that I could. He says, this is what we mean by powerless. What did you think we meant? And it was like, shit. <laughs> so I, I went I went to my sponsor and I, I reported Walter to him. <laughs> and well I I tended to go and complain to Father Joe when I thought somebody was uh and uh there was a, a another guy that uh uh, the last time I came back to AA, I would go to this Friday night meeting in Sonoma, and uh, the place I'd ride at first. And uh, uh, and there was this agnostic guy, one of these World War II kind of tough little guys, you know, with a camper pickup truck, and and he just loved needling me, you know. And and he said, "Oh, you're back again, Father," you know. And he just, you know, yeah. And I I knew it wasn't respectful, you know. And. Uh, <laughs> and he said, so what are you going to do different this time, Father? And I said, well, you know, I'm going to go to meetings, work the staffs, and you know, blah, blah, blah. And he said, you know what? He said, you might find something to believe in. And I get on my high horse. Well, I've always believed in God. And he said, this is a program of rigorous honesty. He says, if you were a Tylenol salesman and you thought Tylenol was a really great product, but when you got a headache, you used aspirin, what do you believe in? He said, you, you know, you go over to your church and, and you, you, you say, God, you are my refuge, my strength, my hope, my consolation, my, my rock, my fortress. When I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil for thou art with me. And he said, but then you go back to your room and you pour this much alcohol. And that's your refuge and your strength and your hope and your consolation. And when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you fear no evil for Jack Daniels is with you. He said, I don't think you will ever get sober if you don't get honest. He said, you believe in drugs and alcohol. So I reported him to Father Joe. (laughs) And Father Joe agreed with him. And he said, you know, all you're capable of believing at this point is that we found a solution. I said, but the second step says came to believe 
He says, you read that as though it said came to believe in. It doesn't say came to believe in. It says came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. You can, you can come to believe that we are not lying to you about finding a solution. He said, if you try conning yourself and God that you have faith when God knows you don't, you're just a stupid con man and a liar. Because your behavior is telling God and anybody who is willing to look what you believe in. The fact you believe there is a God is a completely different thing from believing in God. Trusting. And it was like, so what do I do? And, you know, I, I was the kind that, you know, I, I was uh, uh, talking to some uh, new people the other day and they were talking about, and, and I could identify with them. They wanted to get so much in steps two and three. They wanted to get it in steps two and three. You know, and it was like, but this third step prayer and, 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 you know, and I did the same thing. I remember sitting in, at group three in Sacramento and I had about six months at the time and somebody was getting a five year chip. And you know the horrible thought that struck me? I'd have to wait five years to get a five year chip. <laughs> There's gotta be an angle. There's gotta be a way of getting it quicker. Double points like Ralph's or something, you know. It's like, isn't there an accelerated course, you know. And it's so alcoholic. And I was watching these couple of guys, and they were like so impatient. And I said, you know, it says in step 12, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these, walking these steps. You want to get them before you head out. Then there'd only be four steps. Having had a, step four would be having had a spiritual awakening as the result of a big prayer. Or a big act of my willpower or something, you know. And, and it's a spiritual path. And that was hard for me to accept that I would have to walk a path of steps. And along that path, something would happen that was not brought on by my mind or my understanding. And, uh, and I, I realized that this is what they call on page 27, another page for the Protestants. Um, <laughs> on page 27, uh, they talk about the active ingredient in the program, a vital spiritual experience. Now, as a, an old uh, pharmaceutical user, I, I had to learn things that would relax you and things that would give you ambition. And as a priest, I was invited to a lot of people's homes for dinner. And if any of you were pharmaceutical uh, aficionados like I was, you know what you had to do when you were in somebody's home for dinner. Yeah, the medicine cabinet, exactly. <laughs> And, and you, so you had to know what things would do. You know, I, I think I, I took birth control pills one time. And <laughs> in, in those days, they didn't have the little dispensers, which are very handy because you could always know them afterward. At first, they were just in little bottles. And, and well, I, I never did have any kids, so maybe they work, you know. Uh, but so... Uh, for me, it's very important that the active ingredient in anything, uh, that I know what it is, and the only remedy for our hopeless condition is a vital spiritual experience. And the only way we know to get it reliably is rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. And so we're, um, you know, uh, when I was in Truman's that first place, uh, I got the first taste of spirituality. Um, I wanted to stay in my room the first day because I was shaking, and um, they made me come down to lunch, and they had soup. And if you ever had the shakes, you know that soup is not recommended. <laughs> 
And there's like 16 people at this table with Truman at the end and a place here, and I'm in the middle, and they serve soup, and I know I can't touch it. And Truman says, Seamus, eat your soup. And I go, I don't, he said, eat your soup. And I get it up about here, and it starts to shake because all these people are watching me. And the guy beside me says something that was, like, unforgivable. I was shocked. He said, you got a pretty good shake. <laughs> and I was horrified that somebody would be so impolite. But then the next thing he said opened the door of the fellowship and spirituality to me. He said, mine is almost gone. And I looked over, and he still had a little shake. And then he says, look at that old guy over there. He said, across the table. And I looked up for the first time, and there's this old guy, and he had like one yellow tooth in his head. He's brown as a berry, and he's grinning from ear to ear, and he's putting it in his ear. And he says, look at him. He's been here a month, and he's still shoving it in his ear, you know. And... And he's laughing, and everybody's laughing, and we're all looking at each other. And it's like, this for me was the open door into spirituality. I was like a Martian who finally found a colony of my own people. You know, it was a place where I could take the hat off and let the antenna up, you know, and... and and just be as weird as I knew I was. And we went out on the porch and we sat and we talked and laughed about lying and drinking on the sly and where we hit our bottles and how we got rid of them. And, you know, we talked about all this stuff and it was like, wow, these people know more about me than my family ever knew, than anybody ever knew. And, uh, and, and you know, for the last 38 and a, part, and a bit years, uh, I have been fortunate enough to be in this family that is now my family and with whom I feel completely connected at that spiritual level that is beyond the level of bragging, beyond the level of accomplishment. It is the level where we sit our bottoms on chairs at A meetings and say, I am an alcoholic. And everything else is left outside, and we're family. And I am so grateful to have been invited here uh, and uh, for your patience in listening and the privilege of speaking to you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.